The dominating techniques in AI today look very different from those that led the field decades ago. But many of the debates we're having about the correct direction for the field, about what intelligence is, and whether we're barking up the right tree or not, feel very similar to older debates. As I looked to better contextualize today's discourse, I found myself reading up on older critiques and defenses of different AI paradigms, perspectives on the symbolist and connectionist ways of approaching the problem. Among these was Terry Winograd's critique of the patchwork rationalism that appeared to be a foundational assumption in AI at the time. In place of its assumption that reality has an objective, observer-independent existence, which our cognition merely receives, Winograd argued that cognition dynamically interacts with the world and is thereby a participant in the construction of our experience. Professor Winograd has been one of the earliest pioneers of AI, having developed the famous SHRDOU program in the 1960s, a system in which Marvin Minsky saw great promise. But he eventually swapped AI for IA, intelligence augmentation, and focused his efforts on human-computer interaction. I had the honor of speaking with Professor Winograd about his career and his perspectives on AI and human-computer interaction in the past and present. Beyond this, we dove into his thoughtful perspectives on what it is to be a technologist, how to balance the inevitably moral, political, and humanist aspects of developing technology. This is the Gradient Podcast, and I am your host, Daniel Bashir. If you enjoy these episodes, you can follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast episode. You can also follow us on Substack to get regular notifications whenever we release a new article, newsletter, or podcast episode. You can also find our online magazine at thegradient.pub, where we regularly publish essays by the sorts of people I interview on the podcast. And finally, if you enjoy the episode, it would mean a great deal to us all if you'd consider leaving us a review on whatever podcast player you're using to listen to this episode. It helps more listeners like you find what we're doing and helps us bring in more interesting guests for you to listen to. But now, without further ado, Terry Winograd. Professor Winograd, I think that many are going to know your name for a number of reasons. You've done a lot of important things in both AI and human-computer interaction. And so my usual first question is a little bit about your background, your journey, how you got interested in first working on AI, and then, of course, how that transitioned into your focuses later on on human-computer interaction. Well, to go way back, um, when I was in school, I was very interested in math and science. That was my area. And uh, for my high school science project, I built a kind of uh, mixed analog computer out of parts from a junkyard. Um, and um, it's very simple. I mean, something that, you know, nothing like the computers of today. This is, of course, in the late, early 1960s. Um, but it, it got me interested. And then when I went to college, I had the opportunity to uh, work there. Uh, there's a longer story, which I can tell, but uh, there was a doctor at the local hospital who had a computer, an early, uh, actually a personal computer in some sense. It was the size of a big desk called Control Data 160. And he was calculating dosage of radiation for radio uh, treatment for cancer and uh, had moved from one place to another, had nobody who knew how to program it. So he said, sure, why don't you give it a try? Um, I knew nothing about programming, really, but I bootstrapped up from the bottom and uh, that got me more interested. So by the time I was looking for graduate school after college, I had two interests. I had done this bit of computing um, and I was very interested in language. And um, so I ended up in London for a year 
doing a, a master, not doing a master's, getting no degree, but a program, a year program in linguistics at University College. And then I went to MIT to join the artificial intelligence lab. And what I knew about artificial intelligence was pretty much what I had read in one article in Scientific American, but it made the lab sound like an interesting place. And uh, then once I got there, of course, there was a whole program. I mean, there was like a lot of people, there were a lot of connections, a lot working on a lot of issues. Uh, and so that's why, how I ended up deciding to do my dissertation project on a computer program that dealt with language, with human language. That was the sort of the start. Yeah, yeah. So I do want to get into SHRDLU in a minute, but I'd love to hear a little bit about some of the the atmosphere, especially during your PhD at MIT. I think famously there were, from what I understand, some conflict between sort of different camps, folks who were maybe more aligned with Minsky's views, others who were more aligned with Chomsky, and there was kind of a lot going on there. And I'm aware that you were there sort of during some of that period. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience with that. So I'll, I'll do that in two parts. First, the, the uh, sense of what was going on in the AI lab. Minsky was the director, uh, Seymour Papert, who was actually my formal uh, dissertation advisor, was his partner. They worked together closely. And uh, there was a, a real sense of newness and excitement. What happened is up until mid, well, pretty much the late 50s, early 60s, if you had a computer, it was because you were a very big company or because you were working for the military. Uh, computers were big, expensive, clunky things, and most people had no access. And then Sputnik happened. And the military, in the context of ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, decided that we needed to catch up in science and technology with the Russians. And they, one of the areas that they were interested in funding was artificial intelligence. Um, and so they created labs at several universities, Carnegie, what was called then Carnegie Tech, now Carnegie Mellon University, uh, Stanford Research Institute, um, and MIT. And essentially, they said, we know this stuff is going to be useful to us in the future, but don't worry about military stuff. Just get a bunch of smart students, give them some machines and see what happens. So the spirit in the lab was really, we've got machines to play with that nobody in the past has had that kind of computing with that kind of open charter to just experiment. So our sense was that we were going to discover all kinds of new things just because we were the first ones on the block. I mean, we were the first ones to try out getting a computer to, to display color, to do language, to pick up blocks, to do all those things. Uh, so it was a very heady kind of, and also the other thing is, as you probably know, MIT is full of really smart young hackers. So it wasn't like, you know, the, if you're at IBM lab where the bosses tell you what to do, this was okay, kids go out and do something. And so there was a very youthful kind of, kind of spirit. MIT as a whole has that kind of spirit, um, and is also pretty siloed. I mean, there's, you know, these are people who believe they're the smartest in the world in their area, and their area is the most important in the world. Um, so even within the computing area, there were, com there were, I wouldn't say conflicts, competition between um, the AI group and the, um, what was it called? I've forgotten its formal name, but it was the Timeshared Computer Systems Group, I think CSS. Um, we were on two different floors of a building. We were the ninth floor people. They were the fifth floor people. And it was like, it wasn't warring camps, but it was like, you know, you didn't spend time with those guys. Um, and then across departments, even more so, um, you mentioned Chomsky. Chomsky um, had a very strong view of what language was. And he was actually pretty much against AI as, as a general enterprise. Um, and he was a very opinionated guy, as he still is in his 90s. Um, and Minsky was an equally opinionated guy, uh, who unfortunately isn't around in his 90s. Um, and, um, you know, it was just clear that, I mean, I my story there is I went to a graduate student mixer of some kind early on when I got there. And if I went up to somebody and I, they said, 
I say, what do you do? And I say, oh, I'm in linguistics. And I would say, oh, I'm at the AI lab. That's it. They'd walk away. That was it. They want to talk to me. So it was definitely a feeling of we're the great guys, you know, stick with us, ignore everybody else in the world. Do you feel like during that period, and I suppose later on, there does seem to be um, something to the, I suppose, lost opportunities in cross-collaboration. And, and perhaps maybe there's one interpretation of this as Professor Chomsky maybe saw himself pursuing a project that was just fundamentally mutually exclusive with what he saw the AI lab is doing. And so that was maybe just something that couldn't happen. But I suppose I'm curious how you think about that development, perhaps, of these are two different groups of researchers who could really have something to bring to one another's research. I do recall reading this sort of document that introduced folks to the MIT AI lab. And I remember one of the things that was stated in it, which really doesn't feel like the case for AI labs today, is that students who wanted to work on natural language processing were expected to have a strong background in linguistics. And so I suppose I'm curious how you think about that cross-department collaboration aspect, what might have been lost there, if that was maybe recovered later on, and how that kind of affected the specific ways in which people were doing research. Collaboration is a complex thing. I mean, later on in my career, the uh, design school, the D school at Stanford, it was all about collaboration and cross-disciplinary. I think there are different phases in the development of ideas, uh, just as in the development of people. Um, during some of which you want to basically put put the blinders on and close in. I mean, you really want to focus. Focus is important and, and um, intensity of belief, even if what you're thinking is wrong, it's worth seeing where it goes. So I, mean, I would say that was the phase that it was in at that point. It was so early. I mean, it wasn't, it's later on when things are more mature, then it's really time to go out and say, how does this connect everything else? And how do we get them together? So I'm a great proponent of uh, cross-disciplinary work, but I think back in those days, the right thing to do in some sense of right for the most results was to dig as deep as you can in the hole you're in. That makes sense to me. I'd love to hear, um, as we mentioned earlier, you famously worked on SHRDLU. And I think that there are a lot of interesting questions sort of surrounding this that we can dive into and sort of looking at it as a platform. Dreyfus had some comments on this. Miliere recently has also talked about it in the context of grounding. But I'd love to hear maybe a little bit about if you can take yourself back in time, sort of the the key questions you saw yourself to be investigating, and then a little bit about how that felt to you as a, a point of progress in the field. So that intellectual roots of the AI lab and of all the AI projects at that time were in um, rationalism, um, logic and formulas and symbols. I mean, it was very much uh, how do you create something that you can calculate from that will have the ability to do what you see externally in language. I mean, it's very much the, you know, if it moves like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. And um, so I think that the whole um, grounding of it was the assumption, and this is uh, clearly an assumption, not something you could prove at that point, that what was going on in people's heads was more or less equivalent to what was going on with those symbolic programs in a computer. Way more complicated and so on. I mean, nobody, nobody believed that it was as simple as what we were doing. But that in kind, the brain was a kind of digital computer, uh, even though it had squishy elements, that they were being used in service of something that you could represent uh, in the same way you could a computer program. So the philosophy was um, we're going to come up with programs which can duplicate what it is that people do. And I think there wasn't... Uh, a deep sense that um, it had to do with brains, it had to do with even human experience, but more of a sense that it had to do with input-output calculation. Um, And 
that the kind of calculation was the kind of thing that was what happened when you thought. I mean, if you say there's been a lot of work since then on different kinds of thinking, you know, uh, fast and slow and, and so on. But um, there's a kind of thinking where you figure things out step by step. That's how computers work, right? So that's the kind of thinking that even though when I hear a sentence, I don't figure it out step by step consciously. The assumption was that I was figuring it out step by step unconsciously, that below the surface that was going on, just not part of my awareness. My awareness was there if I was doing a mathematics problem, right? I mean, but it was the same kind of stuff just going on under awareness. So that was the, the underlying assumption. And therefore, the way to get there was to build more and more complex programs using the real world and people as an inspiration for, for them. Um, and one of the things that uh, I felt in starting this project was that it was much more direct if you had a concrete kind of thing you were talking about. It wasn't poetry. It wasn't not even, it wasn't poetry. It wasn't even political uh, discourse or something. It was, okay, what's, what's in front of me and what can I do with it? And that's the third loop came up. There was a project going on with the AI lab to get a robot to manipulate objects on a tabletop, a physical hand eye system with cameras and arms and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that was sort of the inspiration. I said, oh, well, we could talk to something like that. And that was never actually connected. There were too many ways in which it didn't quite fit. But um, in some sense, what I was modeling is what would it be like to, if you were talking to this physical robot that was being built there on the tabletop. And what it did is it made the job much easier um, because you had a clear ground truth. You knew what was there and what wasn't. You knew what was true and what wasn't because it was, it was there. And in fact, when I got into my later work on language, that was the, the key to saying, well, it doesn't really work that way, that you don't have a ground truth. It isn't like everything is simply carved up. Is it a red block or a green block? Um, and what I was, what we were doing collectively in that whole approach to AI, um, was in some sense ran up against that barrier of open-ended meaning. So there were some early responses to SHRDLU. Minsky was very optimistic about the program and what it meant for AI. And Dreyfus famously critiqued this and what he called the old rationalist dream, which you pointed out was one of the, the kind of underpinnings here. And I think that right now we are also seeing very much a resurgence of some of these particular criticisms, but then also more recent forms of it along the lines of what John Searle had to say and then Harnad's symbol grounding problem. These are all becoming once again, very, very relevant debates today. And so I, I suppose I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how you thought about some of those early reactions to the work you were doing in, in Minsky and Dreyfus. Well, so early reactions, again, we were in a kind of bubble of people who were very enthusiastic about what they were doing. And Minsky said, this is great. It's going to be language. He also said that about vision. He also said that about children's stories. He also said that about learning. That his ideology was these were all, anything a person could do, it was just a matter of coming up with the right clever programs. And you could do it too. And so the fact he was enthusiastic was part of his job as leading a lab. Uh, so, and Dreyfus is a funny case. He was actually at MIT for a while. And um, people in our lab either never heard of him or thought he was just off the wall. There was a, a paper, which I still have a copy of. Or no, I think I gave it to the archives. But anyway, um, that... Um, Seymour Papert wrote, the title of the paper was The Artificial Intelligence of Hubert Dreyfus, uh, pun intended. Um, and what he said is, look, all this philosophy mumbo jumbo doesn't mean anything. And if you look at his, he, first of all, Dreyfus doesn't understand the technical details, which he didn't. I mean, that was true. He would have said that it wasn't important, but it's true. Um, and uh, if you look at his examples, they're tricky because, for example, he used chess. At that point, chess was one of the favorite examples about what computers could or couldn't do. And um, Dreyfus, I think, appropriately criticized the hype about computer chess. 
I mean, it wasn't doing as well as what people advertise it as, which is always the case, of course. And um, he came over. To, he came over to the A Lab and played a chess game against the Greenblatt program, which was the AI chess program that was being built there, and lost. And so they made a lot of fuss about. Well, look, Dreyfus is saying AI can't do chess, but he can't even beat it. Um, and of course, that was all in some sense a sidetrack. I mean, first of all, chess isn't the essence of intelligence. Uh, it's a closed world, simple rule game, even though it's com- combinatorially complex. Um, and the state of programs play at a certain point in history doesn't tell you anything philosophical about what they can or can't do, really. I mean, what it says is people are advertising it for more than it is at the moment, which was true. And But of course, people don't like to be told that. So Dreyfus was really not a factor. I mean, I, I don't even know I knew about that paper. I had that. I had had a copy of that, but I don't. There were not a lot of talk spent on that. I see. Did so even if I suppose Dreyfus wasn't somebody you were thinking about explicitly. I am curious to what extent the criticisms he launched sort of made their way into your thinking, if at all. One thing that kind of stuck out to me in some of his writing on SHRDLU was. He um, talks about some of the conditions for rule-like activity. He is at this point kind of invoking later Wittgenstein, which is interesting because it seems like folks today kind of on both sides of the grounding debates about AI when it comes to language are invoking the later Wittgenstein to justify themselves. And (laughs) in particular, um, he writes that intelligibility or intelligent behavior is to be traced back to our sense of what we are, which is something that we can never explicitly know. And so I think that there are some kind of broad things that he's saying there that seem to come up maybe beyond just Dreyfus, but I'm curious to what extent thoughts like that sort of came came into your own thinking. Well, let me say a couple of things there. One is they did much later, not while I was in MIT and not even at the beginning of when I was uh, out of Stanford, but gradually more and more understanding of that. Um, the other is it um, gets back to this question of, you know, how does this relate to the, the current things? And what is it the AI is really claiming to want to do? And I think the fundamental question is, you know, back to the duck. Is it, if it, you can make a quack like a duck, are you finished your job? Or is there something about intelligence that isn't just seeming intelligence? It isn't just passing the Turing test, you know, fooling people, looking like you're intelligent, that's real intelligence. And I think there's a fundamental difference between people who are really functionalists who say, no, you know, if you can make it look, if you you can fool me, then I'm I'm convinced it really, quote, really is intelligent. It really is sentient. I mean, there's a whole lot of set of terms that come with that world of, quote, real intelligence versus people who say, look, you may get it to perform all sorts of things that are human-like, but it it's not grounded in the way a human is. And that's the argument you were just giving from Dreyfus. It's not grounded in experience and physical life and all those things. And therefore it isn't really intelligent. Um, and some people in AI say, so what? If it works, it works. Let's use it. Um, and other people in AI said, wait a minute, I wanted to be the hero of the philosophical world and come up with the, the winning theory of mind. And if it isn't really intelligence, I don't have my theory of mind yet. And that's not something you're going to resolve. That's a difference in what people are trying to do. I do see echoes of that, yes, in in today's LLMs. And I think maybe another version of that is um, Harnad's 1990 symbol grounding problem paper. He's kind of looking at the original version of the Turing test that is text-based. I think he calls this T2, and he sort of submits that Searle's Chinese room argument really it works, but only against this version of the Turing test. And then I think he kind of posits that, well, the appropriate goal for cognitive science, at least to him, is one step above that, what he calls T3 or a a robotic version of the Turing test, which I think then kind of overcomes the sensory motor grounding issue that he identifies with maybe T2 passing systems. And it seems like maybe that's kind of a lot of the barrier that we're dealing with right now. You have a lot of interesting people who are writing things like 
maybe the structure of representations that large language models have in particular domains. Maybe if you think about the relation of colors to one another and the representations, for example, those seem to map onto the way you and I experience the world. And so they kind of use the word grounding to refer to that correlation. But then on the other side, you've got folks like Harnad who are like, that's entirely misguided and just abusing the term. And then you have the folks who are like, well, this doesn't really matter. We can debate grounding all day, as you're saying. But really, it is more just about, well, can these systems do the things we we want them to? So it sounds like we're very much reviving a lot of what was kind of said decades ago, just with new things plugged in. And I I think it can be a little bit hard for me looking at it to think about, well, the technologies themselves have advanced, but the debates, they feel very much the same. I I think the debates are the same because the issues are underlying philosophical issues. They're not technical issues that get resolved because you've got a new thing. I mean, the grounding was a funny one. Do AI-based self-driving cars have grounding? Well, they have vision. They have sensors, they have motors, they have, I mean, you know, the, all the things which you talk about in terms of you can interact with a real physical world, they're doing. And they're using that as part of the AI system to decide what to do. Now, you could say, well, but driving isn't the same as walking and having hands, real hands isn't the same as having, I mean, but you sort of, there's no clear answer to what, what do you mean grounding? And I think this boundary between the linguistic or internal world and the physical world is gradually becoming less of a boundary because more and more, I mean, there are physical robotic systems, not just self-driving cars. Um, So more and more of these AI systems are going to have physical embodiments and physical perceptions and all of these things that have been brought up in this grounding argument. Um, So I don't think that's going to end up being a hinge issue. Um, I mean, for me, the issue, and if you're going to quote old papers, my favorite is John Hoagland. who was a student of Dreyfus's. Um, and he said, he has, there's a whole set of essays based on his statement that the problem with computers is they don't give a damn. And I think that's a question which is not a matter of, you know, does it have hands and legs? But when I talk to a person at some level, different people to different degrees, they actually care about what they're saying. And when I talk to an LLM, it has no concept of care or what it's saying or anything else. It's just doing its thing. If you run into people like that, you say they're insincere, they're not, I mean, you know, you have all sorts of negative assessments of people who you don't feel give a damn about what they're saying. Um, And that's a boundary which is a very different thing from does it have arms and legs? Right. This is very much the the subjective experience side of it. You could, I guess this is also kind of the Chalmers philosophical zombie sort of thing. You can replicate the behavior entirely, but for you and me, there is something it feels like to be saying these words that I'm saying, to be speaking to one another. It's more than that, though. So it feels like is a very slippery thing, because what is feels like. Um, but I'm talking more of, I can trust something that you say in some sense, because I experience you as being like me and giving a damn and caring. And you may fool me. You may lie to me. I mean, it's not like, but my sense of whether I can trust you is really based on an assumption of symmetry. And there's none of that with an LLM. I don't believe anything that's symmetrical that makes it, that it could be just as well tell me something completely crazy as something completely true. And who knows? It doesn't matter. It doesn't care. And I think that sense of it doesn't care uh, is more of a boundary than, um, you know, the ones we've been talking about. It's interesting you bring up that symmetry because I feel like recently we have seen these cases of people who interact with LLMs and then do form a little bit more of that symmetry than the rest of us. So famously, there was Blake LeMond at Google saying that Lambda was sentient. You have folks who have interacted with things like Replica, and you hear stories of somebody who who fell in love with a chatbot. And so it does seem like at the very least for maybe for some people, on that kind of on face, you know, I have this mask of I'm capable of articulating something that reasonably sounds human. That seems to be at least enough for some people to construct in their minds the symmetry that you're just talking about, which seems 
on the one hand, you can say, well, we've just never interacted with systems like this before in human history. But it is, I, I feel like there's maybe a little bit more to it. It just feels both like I can see arguments for why it might be natural that this is happening. But on the other hand, it still does feel very odd. Well, it's natural and is true through human history. I mean, the ability of people to project humanness onto non human things, you know, starts with my grandson's teddy bear and goes through religious idols. And I mean, there's just a whole world of ways in which people say, I'm a, I, I, re- I relate to this other thing, which is not a human in a way which brings in emotions, brings in feelings, I mean, all that kind of stuff. Um, we're just, we're not wired to make a fine discrimination between humans and other things, right? In some ways we are, but so I think the fact that somebody says I'm falling in love with the bot doesn't mean that it, it doesn't say something about the bot. It says something about the person. Um, and um, that can happen and it can happen more. The question really is what does it mean for society if that is happening? Let's just, let's forget the philosophical question of is it real or not? The question is if I'm spending all my time in the basement chatting with my chat bot, and everybody else is, what does that do to our sense of community, our sense of society? Um, and how do we think about those consequences in a way that's neither we'll cut it all off, which is sort of one view, um, nor, oh, well, what the heck? If that works, it works. I do think those are some very important questions that a lot of us should be thinking about very deeply. And maybe we can kind of work our way towards describing those and some other related worries in more detail. I'd love to kind of jump back into the um, kind of chronological story we were beginning to trace. So we were, we kind of got into this realm of thoughts from discussing SHRDLU and you left MIT for Stanford in 1973. You worked on knowledge representation language, which I think Dreyfus also had things to say about over at Xerox Park. And you wrote a number of things here. You wrote a textbook, Beyond Programming Languages, the paper, What Does It Mean to Understand Language, which I think kind of developed some thoughts along the lines of what we were just discussing in a really interesting way. But there was, there was a lot happening here. And so I guess I'd love to hear you recount a little bit of what was going on, um, both maybe the, the events that I kind of just described, but then also how your thinking was evolving during that time. So before I even came to Stanford, I was uh, in Palo Alto for a summer. Um, I had gotten at MIT, I'd gotten to know Daniel Bobro, who he's actually the person whose work was described in that Scientific American article that first got me interested in AI. Uh, He did a natural sort of natural language thing that did algebra problems called student. Um, And he he got his degree at MIT in the same lab a few years before me. And so I got to know him there. He was still working at a consulting company in Boston. And um, he ended up being one of the people who was brought out to Palo Alto to form Xerox Park. Um, this is in the 70, early, early 70s. I came in 72. And um, he created a natural language group at Xerox Park based completely on the MIT AI philosophy, the school. I mean, he, he had graduated there and he was following those lines. Um, and he said, would you like to come out and do a summer? intern. So I came out for a summer, went back. And then when I came out uh, in 73, I joined the faculty at Stanford, but I was also um, consulting at Park. And I spent a lot of my time at Park for many years from then for the next 10 years um, working with this group. I always like to say, you know about Park, right? They did all the mouse, the screen, the, all that stuff. Well, I was there, but I wasn't working on that stuff. <laughs> I was off on the side in this group that was trying to do natural language. Um, and I think contextually, what, from what we're talking about, we realized some of these problems about meaning that were not as simple as how many blocks are there on the table. Um, and we're trying to find a way around that problem, staying within the paradigm of symbolic computing. Um, and that's what the knowledge representation language is about, KRL. And um, there was a lot of sort of experimentation with different possibilities and so on. And... I've described it a little over simply as it just seemed like it wasn't getting anywhere. Now, if you'd asked me at the time, I would say, okay, we've got to work harder. We have to have faster machines. We have to have better software. I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we aren't. But the lurking sort of uh, 
Dreyfus feeling was, well, there's, we're climbing a tree to get to the moon, right? That is, we're not really getting to where we want to get. So there was this period in the early 80s, um, well, actually late 70s it started, when um, I was still working in that framework, my textbook on syntax and so on was still in that framework, but having discussions. And we got into discussions, some of the students, some of the graduate students at Berkeley and Stanford were getting together for a discussion group, which some very interesting people who later went on to do great things. Um, and so I started in that discussion group and through that met some of the Stanford, the Berkeley faculty and through that started meeting with Dreyfus and Searle. Um, and then at that same time, this completely unexpected, what do you want to say, stroke of fate happened, is that there was this fellow named Fernando Flores, who I could spend the whole hour on just his history, which is really interesting. But um, he had been a high government person in the government of Salvador Allende in Chile um, at a very young age. He was minister of economics at the age of 33. Um, and um, ended up fortunately not being under the bombs when the Pinochet army attacked the palace in the coup of 1973, got put in prison, spent three years in prison off an island off the coast. And then due to a very interesting, complicated story, which I'm actually learning more about, he's, I saw him last week and he was telling more of this story, um, ended up in a research associate position at Stanford. And his original work had been in systems, uh, cybernetics kind of stuff, not computers per se, but we're touching on computers. Um, but he was a very intellectually curious and broad kind of person and read a lot of philosophy during his years in prison. Um, and um, I started connecting with him. We started writing a paper together. It turned into a, a monograph sort of became a book, although that wasn't really a finished book. If you read the book that we did together, it's full of interesting, but not really connected pieces. Um, and uh, he was really raising the fundamental questions about what is AI trying to do and how does it work? And what about Heidegger? Um, and then we started having connect discussions jointly with Dreyfus and Searle. Um, and over that few years there, I just shifted. I said, okay, I don't believe anymore that this symbolic approach is going to work. I don't think that KRL is the next step towards language, real language from Schurdlow. I think it's an, another step up a particular path that's not going anywhere. Um, and so I pretty much dropped that line of work and starting in around 1980 uh, said, I mean, the way I'd capsulize it is to say, I'm not interested in getting computers to be like people. I'm getting them interested in getting them to work well with people. So that was a switch. If you've read um, uh, John Markoff's book, he calls it AI versus IA. Uh, AI, artificial intelligence, IA is intelligence augmentation, draws on, of course, Doug Engelbart and other people who had developed that way of thinking. Um, so from there till now, what that 40 years, something like that. Um, if you said, what field do you in? I wouldn't say artificial intelligence. I would say human computer interaction. Um, and that leads to a whole set of different kinds of questions you can ask. Yes. Before we, before we kind of get into that shift directly, I do want to at least touch on a couple of interesting things that you were thinking about with regards to language and AI at this point. And so you had this paper in 1980, what does it mean to understand language? And there are a lot of very interesting things that you kind of discuss here. You go through SHRDLU and KRL, you sort of discuss what was going on and some of the limitations. You touch on a couple of the things that you and I were just discussing earlier. So um, for example, you were saying that we for example, talk about somebody understanding something as like behaving in the appropriate ways upon hearing um, maybe a phrase, but then that kind of sweeps the problem under a different rug. But I guess I'd love to hear a little bit about what you were thinking about as you kind of wrote that paper, your reflections on it at the time. I think maybe some of them are, are along the same strokes, but also I think what you were just talking about as well when it comes to our use of language and the 
articulation of this as like a speech act initiating a commitment that you and I could trust kind of comes in there as well. Yeah, I mean, let me start off with the obvious disclaimer. There's something I wrote 40 years ago. I haven't read recently. I don't remember exactly what was in that paper. I can talk about my overall sense of how things went. You could probably probably quote things to me and I'd say, no, I didn't say that. Um, But anyway, um, there was a mixture of different issues coming in here. And in some sense, Flores, who I just mentioned, was the one who pulled them together in that particular way. So Dreyfus's issue, uh, which is the hermeneutical fellas, I mean, you put all sorts of labels on it, was the one about meaning is not cut and dry. It's not a, something you can capture in a set of symbols. It's background and, and thrownness and a whole set of words, um, which have to do with how do you interpret the world and the language. Searle had a completely different starting point, still coming from Austin at Oxford and or Cambridge, whichever one it was, um, and um, had this whole thing of speech acts, right? That when you use language, you aren't describing the world. That's only one of five different ways that you interact with the world. So you're when you say, I'll promise I'll be there tomorrow, you're actually creating a world, not describing a world. You're creating a set of expectations and commitments that didn't exist before you said it. It's what he called the world-to-word direction of fit instead of the word-to-world direction of fit, which is just the sky is blue. Um, Flores had a background in management. As I said, he was a high minister in in the government and before that had been head of the state-owned companies and a whole set of things. And his real question was how do people collaborate? How do they coordinate? How do they get things done together? And the answer to that isn't true description of the world, although that's useful, but it has to do with this whole thing of making and then following the consequences of commitments. And the grounds language, not in, is it true, but is it sincere commitment? And in a sense, he drew on what Searle said, but then went beyond that talking about the whole cycle of commitment and so on. Um, and so that's where that got into my thinking. Well, I mean, if you said, I would say there are three pillars, right? There was the original speech act stuff, the original hermeneutic stuff, and then the particular combination of that, that, that Flores put together. Um, and if you read, certainly I, I say, I can't tell you what was in that particular paper, but I know if you read our book, that's, you know, chapter five is all about that. Another thing that really stuck out to me in in this paper that I find we are very much doing today, or it seems that way to me, is you kind of discuss this reification of representations issue that scientists deal with when they're describing cognition or, or patterns, which kind of goes something like a scientist observes some recurrent pattern of interactions in an organism then derives some formal representation that characterizes the regularities, then assumes that the organism actually has the representation that was just formalized to be able to exhibit the the regularities and then looks for experiments to demonstrate that. And it does seem like this is something that in many ways people are maybe committing with large language models. But I, I'm curious a little bit about how when you... If, if you remember kind of when you wrote that paper and were observing these patterns, um, I imagine there were probably a lot of analogs. People were committing these same mistakes, maybe both in AI and outside of AI. But I suppose I'd love to hear a little bit about how you thought about, like when you first kind of noticed this issue, where it cropped up, and then if that's something you see kind of continually repeated. So th- I'll go back to one of the early pillars. I mentioned, you know, Searle and Dreyfus and so on. Uh, one of the people who actually visited Flores when he was in prison in Chile was another Chilean named Umberto Maturana, who was a biologist, had actually studied at MIT uh, many years before I did. Um, and he was a philosopher of biology, if you want to say exactly how you would describe it. I mean, he was a biologist. He did real experiments and stuff, but he was really thinking about these fundamental issues. And his whole push, not his whole push, but one of his major things was to see what organisms do, not as mechanisms of representation, but of what he called structural coupling. 
And the idea is when I see an animal behaving or a plant even in some way, I can't say it represents what is in the world and responds to it. There is a feedback loop, cybernetic and cybernetics winds its way into all of this, uh, by which certain external things cause certain changes, perturbations is the word Maturana. Well, he's it in Spanish, but the English translation is perturbations uh, to the internal structure, which then change the behavior of the organism. And there is a correlation in time between the external things and the perturbations and the changes to structure. But it's not that something inside represents what happened outside. Uh, it's simply the consequence of what happened, but it doesn't represent it. And he even goes stronger. He doesn't want to say there's no inside and outside. There's, there's a whole set of more philosophical things about it. But I think the, the underlying thing that I took from it was just because an organism, and I'll use that term broadly, behaves in a way which seems responsive to something that we as an external observer can see, doesn't mean that it must have something internally which correlates to that particular thing that we see externally. That we're putting a post hoc interpretation on what it does. And from an AI point of view, what that says is the fact that a system responds to the world outside it doesn't mean it actually has a representation of what that response is or how it's generated. It's the consequence, I mean, again, in the cybernetic kind of perspective of the entire interaction. Yeah, so I, I do think that. Um... Right now, as we sort of see more forms of research, like mechanistic interpretability, for example, I think we're kind of starting to see maybe a little bit more of how can we start to deduce what is kind of going on inside contemporary systems. It's um, you, you hear a lot the line that, yes, these large language models were trained just to predict the next word, but look at what they're doing. There must be something more complicated going on in there. And I suppose when you sort of lop on these additional reinforcement learning from human feedback or forms of instruction tuning, then you get something that's at least a little bit more complicated than next word prediction. But you, you still see this kind of two directions of, well, yes, I can see how this thing was built up during training, but then I look at the output and what the output suggests about the internal mechanisms and what must be going on inside, people are kind of holding, it seems, these pretty contradictory ideas in their head. And I would say that what the Maturana view says is it doesn't mean it's what's going on inside. It looks like it from the outside, but it doesn't mean that's what's going on. And one example I've used, and I think I used this in the book, I don't remember if it in the article or not, um, is I have some one-celled animal that moves toward light. So my first reaction is, okay, it senses light and it has some representation, which says, if you sense light, move to where it is and so on. And then I go in, I try to understand how it works. It turns out it's got a membrane around it and the chemicals in the membrane are contracted by a reaction, photo, photo reaction. And that's it. Now what happens? Well, you've got this one, this blob and light shines on one side of it, the side the light shines on contracts and therefore it moves that, or expands. I forgot, you get it the right direction, right? And it moves toward the light. So from an external point of view, you can say it's sensing and moving toward light. From a mechanistic point of view, it's simply a matter of changing the stiffness of a membrane for photosynthetic properties, right? And there's no representation. There's no sense it's doing that. And I think that's a little bit like what goes on with these systems. That you look at it and you say, look, it responds to this in this way. It must be, quote, thinking or understanding, whatever your word is. It doesn't have to. It can still move that way, even though it, it, there's no, in, no inner sense of real understanding. Right. I guess there's, there's this kind of epistemic barrier question that we have, and I suppose a common cognitive flaw. And I, I guess maybe the thing we're running up into now that, of course, we've run into many times before is that as these systems get harder and harder to grok, to be able to read off the, the mechanisms from the behavior, then we are probably going to get more likely to kind of commit that mistake of imagining that we really can read off what's going on inside just from that external behavior. I think that for me, 
the big question isn't, is it really thinking, is it really this or that, whatever, but how do we coexist with systems uh, that we don't have that kind of understanding? And we, under, we know that we don't really have that kind of understanding. We can get pieces of it here and there. Um, and we want to fit it into our everyday lives. So I've been having this actually very interesting email exchange with Doug Hofstadter, uh, who was absolutely irate when his university put out a memo saying, Here's, here are ways you can use AI in your teaching. It was completely inappropriate to you know, replace human. I can give you, he can give you the context. Um, and the question really isn't replace. The question is, okay, what's the right way to interact with them so that the combination both does useful things, which AI is pretty good at now, uh, and is responsible and has some sense of con, you know human concern for what happens, which AI doesn't have. And we're we're now moving into a stage, and we're going to be living with that kind of mix. We're not, I don't believe that you know AI is going to take over, and we're going to be uh, squashed. You know, my, my my advisor Minsky used to say, in ten years, of course this was like thirty years ago, AI will get smarter than we are, and if we're lucky, they'll keep us as pets. Um, I'm not worried about that. I'm not one of the catastrophists who you read about in the press. But I think the worry is that we will, in more and more areas of human life, replace having a human do something with having the AI do it, even though it only partially connects with what people do. Yes, I think there's an, an interesting, um, well, I think you, you kind of said, I think it was actually something you said at one point about there is a lot of talk about the future that we are going to inhabit with AI systems. And there is this underlying assumption that certain human jobs, certain human functions are going to be completely automated, but that this isn't an inevitability. It's, it's really a choice about how we are going to integrate these systems into society. And I think that maybe in some of the kind of long-term prospects, what is going to happen with AI language, there does seem to be this underlying, this is the pace of human progress, and it is inevitable that it is going to look exactly like this. And so there is this kind of conflict between, at once, the agency that we humans have in the things we are building, but then also maybe some of this implied lack of agency in we're all building towards something and the thing at the end looks almost inevitable that we sometimes see, I feel. Well, you're starting to move into another whole territory about, you use the word progress. Um, and I think there is a kind of materialistic, dare I say capitalistic uh, view of progress, which is more efficiency, more more goods, more, you know, the things which a company can sell and profit off of, you know, put it in simple terms. Um, and there are plenty of people who say that is not human progress. <laughs> human progress has to do with people and the kind of interactions they have and the way we live with each other. And in fact, this materialistic view of progress gets it completely in the way of that. And we need to get out of that. And I think this is a question that's going to be fought out on the territory of AI. Because if you say, is it more efficient and more profitable to use AI for this, that, or the other, you get one set of answers. And that's not necessarily the set you would get if you started from a different question of what's real human progress. Mm -hmm. As you were kind of mentioning earlier, you made this transition from AI to IA or HCI and kind of wrapped up in that. You founded the Stanford HCI group in 1991. You were also involved in the creation of the symbolic systems major. And so in the 1990s, you were also um, involved quite a bit with, with Google. I, I'd love to hear a little bit about your sort of transition during that period. I think we've discussed some of the thinking you had both before and then after and how that's kind of evolved. But I'm, I'm curious to hear in a little bit more detail what that transition looked like for you at the time? I think the transition partly had to do with the job of being a computer faculty member, um, which is during that time, and the book that I did with Flores was being done during that time. He didn't come out till 86, but we were working on it much earlier than that. And 
uh, my thinking about computers and AI and so on had evolved. And I was, in some sense, making my professorial career by philosophizing, right? By talking about these issues and writing about these issues, the paper you mentioned and so on. Um, and what I realized is that I had another part of my job was supervising grad students and they could not make a career by philosophizing, not in computer science. They were in the philosophy department. That's a different question. But if they were in computer science, they needed to do something that was more computer relevant. And when I looked at HCI, there was a huge opportunities because we were just learning how to get computers to interact well with people. But it wasn't the kind of thing where you could say, here's a theory, go out and apply it. Here's a direction that's determined by the intellectual side, which is going to now, you're going to prove it by building something. So I ended up supervising a bunch of projects, different ones, where there were some interesting interaction issues that were being addressed, uh, but not in a particularly focused or coherent way. It was if you said, if you looked at those projects and you'd say, well, where is the AI, the philosophy, this winter grad philosophy in them, I could say, well, see, that they're thinking about it in a slightly different way because of this, but it wasn't like, okay, here's being applied in steps A, B, and C. So I think what I did over the years was to identify projects and students, and I gave my students a lot of latitude in what projects they took on. I did not say, here's the next thing that needs to be done. Um, that could, in a way, both reflect some of this attitude that came from the philosophy and also be relevant and useful for people who are using computers. Um, and that was the flavor of a lot of the work. And I had somebody who worked on eye gaze. I mean, I, I could list you, but it would feel like a, a, you know, a catalog. It wouldn't feel like a coherent research program. Um, and then of course, the one that was most notable was Google. Uh, was, And it really wasn't my origination. I mean, I was Larry's advisor, but he came to me and he said, we're thinking about doing this and this and this. And which of those do you think I should work on? And I would say, well, this seems to have it. And, and I would sort of help hone his ideas, but it wasn't like he was taking my philosophy and building it. And I guess kind of involved in this too was the the Stanford Digital Libraries Project. Could you tell me a little bit about like how, how that factored into um, those that kind of beginning of, of Google. Yeah, well, that was the origin. I mean, in a few years before Larry, and I, I, I'm terrible at dates, so I won't try to pin down years. You can look them up. Um, there was a call put out by a group of government agencies jointly. So NSF was the lead agency, but there was also ARPA and a couple of others I've now forgotten, but, uh, and they said, we would like universities to look at this problem of information silos on the web or on, sorry, on the internet, there was no web. Um, and if you looked at what was available online at that time, there were things like Lexis and Nexus and a bunch of highly specialized professional data, um, sources, and if I was a lawyer, I would go to Lexis and I would look up law cases and so on on Lexis. But there was nothing which had the flavor of how do I pull together information from different places, from multiple sources online. And again, I won't say on the web because the web sort of emerged during this period, but it wasn't there yet. Um, so that was a digital libraries project. And Berkeley had one. We had one. Carnegie had one. I've forgotten where they all were. And uh each one took its approach to how do we integrate information from these sources where the what we were thinking of as the sources were these uh, elaborate professional databases in some sense, because that's what people like NSF were interested in, scientific databases and so on. Um, that's when the web came along. I mean, it, it sort of, I, I can't pin down the date and you, know, you can pin down the date exactly when Berners-Lee got it started. but. Um, and all of a sudden, you didn't have to be a big professional company to put information on the internet. All you had to do is have an Apache server and a little bit of bandwidth, and you were an information source on the internet. And the problem of information search completely shifted from how do you combine these well-curated sources to how do you handle this diversity of random stuff that everybody is tossing on here? 
that shift really didn't happen. I mean, if you look at our other things from that project, they were pre that shift. But Larry and Sergey came in at the moment when that shift was becoming apparent. And they said, well, why don't we pull together information from the whole internet, the whole web, sorry, the whole web, not just from these curated sources. And uh, at that point, actually getting, quote, the whole web was a realistic thing, uh, even for a project. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it was thousands of sites, not billions of sites, right? And um, so that was how, in some sense, Google grew off to the side of the rest of the project. It was part of, I mean, it was funded by the digital libraries and, you know, we met together and all that kind of stuff. But if you said in, in terms of its characteristics, it was really unique in what it tackled. It tackled the open web, not the collection of uh, good sources. And of course, the problems are totally different then, because if you're pulling together reliable sources, your problem is how do you find the most relevant stuff? If you're pulling together stuff from the random web, the problem is how do you tell what's real? How do you tell what's true? How do you tell what's worthwhile? Um, and that was the shift that led to page rank. And I, mean, I can talk about the technology of it, but it's, you know, what's relevant really is that they said, okay, if we're going to provide people information, and they weren't the first to do web crawlers, right? There was Alta Vista, there was Lycos, there was a bunch of projects where people were going out and collecting information from the web. But it was slow, clunky, and got you random, really random stuff. So their question is how can we make it fast, efficient, and get you relevant stuff? And that was really the insight to produce what was originally, well, the Google at Stanford, and then, of course, the company. One, one interesting connection maybe to bring in here, especially with Google and the task of surfacing relevant information, making it easy to access to just anyone is now with the rise of, of chatbots, the way in which we access that information, the level of personalization we see, there have been lots of maybe slightly overblown proclamations about Google being entirely replaced by your own personal chatbot that surfaces whatever information is relevant to you and synthesizes it in these different ways. And there does seem to be something to the way in which that information is conveyed. But then, of course, you run into some of the questions that, that you had just raised. How do you verify what is factual about the world? How do you know that this information comes from reliable sources, especially when it's something that might be related to scientific studies that are still in progress and we don't have full answers to yet? I'm, I'm curious how you've thought about some of these recent exchanges just regarding the ways in which we are going to consume information and how that might look different going forward. So I think there's a deep problem here. Um, you look at how people have evolved over, you know, very long periods of time. We basically understood things we heard by language as coming from people. And we knew who those people were and we knew we could, who we could trust. So if I go out to the corner and I go to the bar and I go to the bartender and I ask him for a fact about politics, I know I'm asking the bartender. And if I, on the other hand, go to the professor of political science at Stanford, I know that there is a whole world of social interactions that led to his credential, his or her credentials, um, degrees, publications. I mean, there's a web we've created, not in the worldwide web sense, of trust, of how do we verify that this is, you know, I want, I read it in the New York Times. It's different than if I read it on, you know, the Drudge Report. Um, and what's happening with online information in general and way faster with this chatbot stuff is you lose that pin underpinning. You, you don't know where it came from. The chatbot gives you a set of facts some of which may be real and valid and some of which may be completely invented. And you can't say, well, where'd you get that? Now they are working on providing ways to trace back to particular sources for things. And I think that's trying to deal with that. But I think in the large, I mean, the whole social media thing, when I see a tweet that says something, I don't really know where that came from. I mean, a little bit of trace back who forwarded it from who and so on and so on. But it's not like, oh, I read it in the New York Post versus 
the New York Times. There, I know if I see those two, I know something about where it's coming from. Uh, and I think this notion that Google Google doesn't well, there was a step it made probably about five years ago. I don't actually know the timing towards knowledge boxes or whatever they call them, which is I, I look for something and it does what it always did, which is says, here's a bunch of places you can link to. But it also says, here's a little paragraph that we'll give you about it. And I have to trust that when Google gives me a paragraph, they're being reliable about who they're getting their information from and so on. And I do, but that's a particular company, a particular history and, and all that. Um, so they've already moved. I mean, that knowledge box is sort of a chat bot. I mean, it's not as interactive, but it's saying, I'm going to give you something specifically linguistically put together for this purpose, not a link off to somebody's article that they wrote in some journal. Um, so we've moved away to some extent already from linking to rely, linking to sources whose reliability you can evaluate not necessarily reliable sources, but who you have some notion of their reliability, to simply saying, here's the information. Trust me. And um, then we're at the mercy of the companies who do that. Um, There are already, you know, biased, uh, you know, knowingly biased chatbots. You know, you get a right-wing chatbot and it will give you information. And you know, you don't know where it's getting it, but you probably don't want to know. (laughs) I won't. Um, and there's going to be more and more of that where you simply can't distinguish what is the underlying, and again, going back to the giving a damn, what is the underlying commitment, the underlying care that is brought to putting us together? And there's a journalistic tradition. The journalists are all up in arms, right? Because there's a tradition of hundreds of years of journalistic integrity. And this just cuts around it. Um, so uh, it's part of the larger problem of online information and social media and so on, which is we're getting bombarded by stuff that is being given to us because somebody thinks it's good for them to give it to us, whether that's, you know, advertising based or whether it's political based or whatever, uh, instead of because it's something that we can trust. There are a lot of interesting directions with what you just said. One of them I think a lot of people have observed is maybe speaking to journalism, the kind of loss of trust in like overall journalistic organizations or institutions. And then you see kind of the branching off of very high profile writers who people trust. And that kind of disaggregation of information consumption, like, oh, I trust this particular journalist. Let me consume my information from them directly and have that kind of one, one, um, person to, you know, well, I guess many consumers, but more like I'm, I'm consuming the information from a single person I trust and that implied care that you're mentioning. But then I think there's also some kinds of design issues that come into play here when it comes to the ways in which we signal this is trustable information. I think Twitter, for example, one thing that's kind of notable about it is Anybody, you know, no matter what their credentials are on the subject they're speaking of, they just put something out into the ether. And to me, looking at my Twitter timeline, it all looks the same from the text. Now you have some small things like community notes and people putting context into things, but there's very little that differentiates that. I've also noticed that YouTube recently has started kind of flagging these credentials for certain channels, like this person is a licensed therapist or a licensed doctor. So that's somebody who puts out that kind of information. You at least know like, okay, this person kind of has credentials. And so I I suspect there are strategies like these that maybe mitigate some of the issues we're talking about here. I'm curious to you how far that goes along the road of really solving them, reinstilling that, you know, I live in an information ecosystem where I can trust what I'm getting and kind of have that trust in people's care and maybe what there what there might be left to do. So there's, I mean, yeah, it doesn't solve. Uh, that's, uh, but I mean, I think there's a, another big trend which is tied in with this. It's not identical, but part of it, which is the shift from a social contract based on institutions to one based on personalities. And you could say Trump is the embodiment of that, but um, 
you say, you know, New York Times is an institution. If you ask me, who are the people who run it? Who are the people who are the major editors? I usually don't know. But I trust because they're an institution. The Supreme Court is an institution. I don't, you know, and there was a day when you didn't say who was, what are the personal views of this justice? It was, it is justice. It's the courts. Um, and, you know, with reality shows and influencers and, and I mean, there's a whole world of stuff that is profitable on the web um, that basically replaces that with, are you attracted to this personality? And first of all, that produces more, diff- more uh, division because there are really strong differences in who's attracted to what personalities. The idea of institutions is we could agree on them. Um, you know, you don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, it's the court. That's breaking down. Um, and you said, I'm attracted to certain people that I see on the, on, on the web. And the answer is, what is it you're reading there? And partly it's, are they fun? Are they, do they have a, an interesting point of view where interesting doesn't mean right. It just means makes you think or gets you going. Um, and of course, what gets you going is different from what gets somebody else, a MAGA person going. I'm assuming you're not. Um, and um, I don't, if you said, how do we solve that? I don't know. I mean, you try to shore up the institutions which are based on social, larger social contracts instead of glorifying individuals who manage to attract attention. Um, but that's hard because the profitability all goes with the individuals. Yeah, there are a lot of, I guess, incentive-based structures here. And to an extent, I wonder, how, I mean, there's both, I, I guess you can both attribute this to incentives. And if any one person is acting in this way, then all the rest take that as permission to do so. And there's kind of this collective action problem. But then to the the individualist aspect of it, people do like getting recognition. And so I think there's maybe something a little bit more intrinsic about that than just a collective action problem. Yeah. And, and again, I use Trump as an example. I mean, he wants attention. It's like, don't, don't, I don't care what you say about me. Just spell my name right. It was the old, used to be the old thing, right? That I, I saw an article about why he had a great day the day he got indicted because he was on all the news programs. <laughs> Indeed. I, I want to talk a little bit more, I guess, in detail about, well, we've, we've been kind of like circling this conversation already, but about contemporary things that HCI researchers might have to say, or ways in which HCI is kind of coming together with thinking about AI. And I, th- I suppose there's roughly two directions for this. The, the last episode I aired was with June Park, who is doing research at Stanford HCI, and he had this very interesting generative agents paper that I think demonstrates a lot of important things about how AI, how modern LLMs can help contribute to HCI research and helping us design better social systems. And then on the other hand, you have, well, how do we apply the techniques of HCI or the ideas to how we think about doing AI? I think that one thing you've said before is that when we design technologies, we are designing ways of being in the world. And so that would have to apply to AI as much as to any other technology. I I am curious just how you think about especially in this past decade, perhaps, how this confluence of AI becoming a very big thing in a lot of people's lives, and then, of course, especially recently sort of hitting the mainstream, where that intersection, which HCI kind of comes in maybe a little bit more broadly. Well, HCI has shifted a lot over the years. And when I first got into it, which is more or less when the Macintosh came out, there was a sense that these computers were hard to use, hard to control. You needed to figure out ways that human could interact with them, right? That, hence HCI. Um, and it was uh, very much a model of here is a person, here is a computer. How do you get them to work better together? And that's still being done. I mean, you know, when you talk about our, our VR goggles, a better way to interact with your email than a screen and a mouse, that's HCI in the traditional traditional sense. And it's not like that's eliminated. But what happened with the rise of the net, basically, and, and all that was gone with it, or the web, 
um, is the recognition that when you talk about people on computers, it's not one person sitting in front of their computer. It's a whole society interacting through a incredibly complicated network of computers, a network of institutions, not necessarily just the physical computers. And that if we're going to talk about the problem of how to hum- people interact with computers, you've got to broaden out. And if you look at what's in the CHI conferences over the past decade or two, you see this complete shift from one person, one screen or one goggle, which is still there. There's still a track that's that, to what are computer systems doing to the way we interact in society as a whole. And it's a much harder set of problems because there's usually not a solution. It's not like you say, oh, well, clearly if we have the mouse left-handed instead of right-handed, this is going to happen. I mean, uh, it's like, okay, there are, you can perturb the comp- it's a cybernetic system, right? You can perturb it in various ways and things may happen that are good. Things may happen that are bad. Sometimes you don't know before you do it what's going to happen. And a lot of what's happened with the social networking is that. I mean, well, let's, you know, I mean, go back to Zuckerberg, right? He said, we're, we're going to have Facebook and it's make everybody be better friends. And that's well, not exactly what Facebook has accomplished, right? Uh, but he believed, I honestly believe he believed it at the time. So it wasn't like he said, oh, we're going to screw people and make a lot of profits and so on. That wasn't his, wasn't his thinking. Um, so, um, I think HCI, I mean, when I read the HCI, I get the magazine, the, the Interactions magazine is called, put out by, by Kai. And, uh, you know, I, I have mixed feelings. It's all about these social issues. And it's all very sort of abstract and philosophical because there aren't simple solutions to any of it. And then where do you move into sociology and philosophy? And when are you still doing HCI? And I think the the field is struggling with that as as a question. It's still let's build new things and see what they do. Um, but what they do has to be measured in terms of this social structure, which is very hard to get a grip on. And and that's why you were in the, early in the interview. You talked about interdisciplinary work, and I think it's becoming re- very much recognized. And the Stanford uh, Human what is it called Human Centered AI Initiative is really focused on this, which is you're not going to answer these questions unless you bring in people whose expertise is in humans and societies. You know, having technical expertise is just one leg of the... Right. And that seems very much a part of, of the D school as well, which I know you kind of had a role in founding back in 2004. Do you feel like um, maybe in the context of the D school, it's interesting and kind of notable just the number of very important things that have come out from there, the students and the ways they've thought about building products and all of this. And there, of course, is kind of this like very natural interdisciplinary substrate and what goes on there. Do you, do you find that that approach, maybe now that we have a number of of different areas that have achieved the maybe requisite maturity for people to really approach things in an interdisciplinary fashion? Do you find that maybe the ways in which people come out of that background, that they build technologies and think about these um, products they're building, do you find that, I guess, more more thoughtful in the ways you might have been hoping? I think to some extent, but there's really a couple of different dimensions here. And eSchool was a response and not individually, but in, in part of a trend, which is traditional HCI said, okay, here's a person, here's a computer. We need to understand the interaction. How do you understand it? We're going to create a lab. We're going to get scientists who are external, who come in with their one-way mirrors and watch people doing things. And um, the person is a you know scientific subject, right? And the scientist is the HCI person and so on. And what the design philosophy was saying is you can do that, but it's not going to give you insights into new things to do. And if you want insights into new things to do, you have to treat the user not as the subject of scientific examination, but as a generator of possibilities. And that's what I would call the design philosophy. I'm being very simplistic here, but is how do you set up structures in which the person who's actually going to be using and affected by this is part of the generation of the possibilities for what it can do? So the whole emphasis on doing a lot of user studies before you start to design anything. You don't say, I'm building a widget. 
You say, I'm trying to understand what people in grocery stores do, right? whatever it is. So I think th that shift has been very successful in, in places. I mean, as always, these things are, are spotty, but uh, it's really been how can we uh, shift the focus from the builder to the people who are being built for? And the assumption there, and of course, it grew out of a design consulting firm where there was always a clear answer to who are you building it for. It was a dual answer because it was the company that's going to sell it and the customers who are going to buy it. But you had a very clear sense of the context of use. Um, that's not an easy approach to these systemic things. I mean, if I say, how do I design a better way for people to get groceries in the grocery store, to use a famous example from their this video, um, to how do I design a better Twitter? Well, what does better Twitter mean? Who cares for what reasons about what it does or doesn't do? And it's not a simple, okay, go out and watch the user for a while and see what they do, right? It's really how, what are the consequences? Maybe the people who are doing it don't even, who will be using it, don't even see the consequences directly because they're hidden. They have to do with the erosion of trust or whatever it is. And that's not something you think about when you say, hey, I'll retweet that. It's a cool tweet. Um, and I think the methodology, and I, I get the emails from IDEO.org, which is trying to apply design methodology, doesn't extend to those kinds of questions. It's a great methodology and it works very well for lots of things. But I think it doesn't give you an answer to how do we deal with these larger social uh, system issues. I think that... Also, I suppose some of the design thinking that you've been speaking about and the ways in which these questions are approached that has been coming more and more into, and I guess we kind of already discussed some of this in the context of chatbots earlier and the way people consume information, but, and how we think about AI. I think there've been a lot of concerns fairly placed about, well, these systems present information in a certain way, humans, who might interact with AI powered systems, whether it's chatbots or for example, more, more vision-based systems. We want to make sure that those systems are actually trustworthy in kind of all the relevant ways. And it seems like it's been relatively a rather recent thing for people to come at that with the perspective of, okay, I, I have this AI product. I'm not just trying to design the coolest technology something that has the highest accuracy on some benchmark, but what does it really kind of achieve for the person? And how do I sort of design my model into, or, or bring my model into this kind of larger system that I'm thinking about as well? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these questions are accelerated recently, but are old. I was just yesterday, took my grandsons to the Computer History Museum. And there was an exhibit there about Photoshop. And it showed a very well-known picture from the Vietnam War era. In the photo, uh, Jane Fonda, is it Jane Fonda? Anyway, some known liberal anti-war person and John Kerry are in the picture. Turns out they were two totally separate pictures that were Photoshopped together. John Kerry was never on a stage with Jane Fonda. And the question was raised, and now we're talking 50 years ago, of what's going to happen when you can't trust what you see because it could have been photoshopped. And in some sense, the AI stuff is, you know, Photoshop cubed, right? Or whatever the right thing is, but uh, completely blurs that line. And so these questions have been around for a long time, but they become much more visible and prominent when you have the chatbots and photo, you know, photo creators and, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's interesting. Photoshop, to pick an example, there's now this scene extender, or whatever they call it, which is you have or uncrop, right? You have a picture and you would like to have taken a broader view. And you say to AI, fill in what the broader view would have had in it. Well, that's form is, you know, and if the examples you see are all just nice aesthetic changes. But that's an interesting question. Can you say to AI, fill in what the world would have looked like if something were different? Yeah, it does. It does seem like there are I mean, it's, as always, kind of the dual use question. I think that there are a lot of ways in which this these technologies enable 
important forms of, of creativity, things we couldn't do before. They, of course, lower the barrier to access, all, all of these things that people kind of say about them, which are relevantly true. But then to what you're saying, that does raise the question of trust. And I know people are kind of working on things like, for example, when it comes to um, chatbots, watermarking, chatbot outputs, Scott Aronson kind of worked on this at OpenAI. So you do have these methods. And I suppose it's something like we're we're always going to be playing this cat and mouse game when it comes to the the technological ways we can approach these problems. But at the same time, I, I think, as always, it's to be suspected, these are probably issues that do not admit a purely technological solution at all. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that I haven't read the watermarking stuff in detail, but it strikes me as a very funny approach. Because first of all, if there were one group that was doing all of AI, you might say, okay, they could do this. But it's, you know, there's a competitive scene out there. There's multiple countries, there's multiple companies, there's independent. So just because Google watermarks their stuff doesn't mean that we can trust stuff. I mean, then you're back to the institution question. Do you trust Google more than the ones who don't watermark and so on? Um, And then the other is, as you said, it's a cat and mouse game. I mean, I don't believe any scheme like that is going to not be breakable by somebody who's smarter in the next algorithm and says, okay, here's how to break the watermark. And we've seen that in all sorts of areas and it's going to happen. I think a good note for us to begin closing up on is we've been sort of skirting around topics related to this discussion, but a few years ago, you um, gave a talk and had some discussion in this event, My Politics as a Technologist. And I, I really loved watching that. And I do think it's importantly true in a lot of ways that the technological does become fundamentally political. And I think that there are a lot of ways in which technologists my age, you know, who are kind of in their early, mid, late 20s, a lot of us are, I I believe, thinking about these questions. When um, I was studying at Harvey Mudd College, for instance, too, I think that there was a very deep sense in which a lot of students felt like these were important discussions to be had, like what are, when we have uh, clinic sponsors who are sponsoring, you know, projects that students work on, who do people feel morally okay working for? I think these questions started to come up. And I feel very glad that enough of the student body, excuse me, cared enough about these issues that they kind of blew up into these very large student body discussions. But I think that, I guess it seems true that there is kind of always more to be done. And in today's environment, we have at once these questions of, well, different AI systems are going to have different sorts of biases and different people working on them. We have this geopolitical environment where maybe there are some analogs between the US-China situation today. We, you know, have had all of these things about semiconductor restrictions. And you spoke during that event about the U.S.-Russia saber rattling. So it does feel like in many ways there are kinds of echoes of the past going on. And so I guess as somebody who's really thought deeply about your role as a technologist in this broader kind of political milieu um, with all these historical and cultural influences, how would you recommend somebody who you know, will maybe use me as an example, but somebody kind of my age who is pretty young, you know, a a fairly young technologist thinking about how do I kind of examine my my own role within all of this and figure out how to act, how to be a technologist in that kind of sphere. How how have you thought about it? And I guess, how do you kind of advise younger people in thinking about these questions? I think there's a couple of things there. Um, one is, I mean, as people who have a technological mindset, which I do myself, I have to admit, um, tend to think, okay, let's, there's a problem here. Let's solve it and move on. And I think the important recognition is that's not how life is. Life is not a set of problems that you move on. Life is, uh, my, my colleague Flores, who I've mentioned several times, likes to analogize, it's like whitewater rafting down a river. All right, you're always trying to avoid that next rock and think about where you're going to go after that, but you can't really predict ahead and say, this has been solved, right? You're always thrown into the next set of issues. And I think recognizing that and recognizing that doesn't mean you can't do technological work, but you're always doing it in the middle of the river. You're always doing it in the context of what's going to happen and that I didn't expect. There's always things that you're not going to expect. Um, 
The other is a social question, which is, and I wrote a paper called uh, Computer Ethics, I've forgotten what it was called, and argue there that the question of being ethical in doing technology is not coming up with the right answer, you know, yes, good, no, bad, um, but being engaged in a social conversation about the questions that and again, as part of this philosophy, you're never going to come up with the answer. And therefore, finding a group of people who you can communicate with and kind of have converse with for whom these issues are real and who will on an ongoing basis be a revelation of what needs to be thought about and what can possibly be done as background to the technical work you do. I think that's that's critical. Don't isolate. That makes a lot of sense to me. Maybe one other component of this question, and, and perhaps the last one I'll ask you is, in thinking about these questions, maybe since we're kind of broadly talking a lot about AI in this conversation, we can talk about how it pertains to AI, um, both at the individual level, but then at this kind of broader level where we're seeing a lot of push on these questions about AI regulations and pauses, and how do we kind of make these things work well for everyone? As I, I guess we've kind of said about a number of things, there really are echoes of the past here. And that seems to be true for some of the questions of regulation, maybe for notions of individual agency here. Are there, I guess, what do you think that people like myself, people who are thinking about some of those broader questions too, can learn from the past? What should we kind of be taking away from that as we navigate this, this time? That's a good question, and there's no one thing to learn, but I think it sort of goes back to the thing I just said, which is go back and look at the past about how people thought about what would happen and how wrong they were in many cases, because that's not exactly what happened, even though they were somewhat right and so on, and how they navigate that shift of what you learn when you actually get into it as opposed to what you think ahead of time. Um, there are plenty of good examples. Somebody should write a book. I'm not ready to, but. Uh, pulling on examples from the past because they're, I mean, you, know, you can even go back to very fundamental things like the automobile, right? Henry Ford did not think about urban sprawl. Um, but if you said urban sprawl is the result of the automobile, well, yeah, it is. It wasn't in that sense, right? And I think there are a lot of good examples don't even have to come from computing, you know, high tech. They can come from technologies of all kind, which um, lead you to get a deeper sense of how to uh, continually be aware of the the changing world, the shifting world. I think this is a, a really great takeaway. And I do hope everyone who ends up listening to this starts to think about these issues. Um, Professor Winograd, it was really wonderful speaking to you. I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with me today and, and being so generous with your time. It was really an honor. I enjoyed it. All right. Good question. And that is a wrap, my friends. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, you can subscribe to The Gradient on Substack to receive not just this podcast, but also our articles and newsletters directly to your email. You can also visit us at thegradient.pub, where you'll find all of that, as well as more information about The Gradient and how you could even contribute if you're interested. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate your feedback. If you'd like to leave a comment or review, we'd love to know how we can make this series more interesting and informative to you. And with all that, I'll leave you until the next episode.